Bun găsit, doamnelor și domnilor! Ne aflăm la BSDA, Black Sea Defense Aerospace and Security, cel mai mare eveniment de apărare organizat anual în București. După cum știți, în ultimii 2-3 ani am devenit cu toții jurnaliști, public mai atenți la ce se întâmplă în acest domeniu și la nevoile de înzestrare ale armatei române. Ne aflăm la standul RTX, un grup de companii din care fac parte Raytheon, producătorul celebrelor rachete Patriot și de asemenea Collins Aerospace și stăm de vorbă cu domnul Fabrice Fontanier, Key Account Director la Collins Aerospace. Welcome, Mr. Fontanier. Welcome to Romania. I think you were here before. Oh yeah, I'm coming to Romania almost every month. So, uh, so, so I will, I will ask you that. My first question is, what's your impression about Romania? And also, what do you think is the, the future of the Romanian army? Um, first of all, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable in Romania. Uh, as we were just discussing, uh, I'm a French national and I have a, a lot of people understanding and speaking French and with a long history between the two countries. So uh, it's something that uh, I can really feel, especially uh, in uh, the aerospace industry, uh, because we we have a partnership uh, between Romania and France. And for us, RTX, we have been also involved in a lot of the renovation of the Puma helicopters, for instance, uh, where we are providing to uh, IR Brashov a number of uh, equipment that are uh, today uh, on, 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 the, on the platform. So uh, Romania is facing a, a great challenge like most of the NATO nations because we need to uh, upgrade our capabilities across Europe in order to keep our advantage uh, of, over uh, threats that are uh, around us. And uh, we need to do that. We need to speed up a little bit the implementation of a number of uh, new capabilities that should be uh, installed across all the NATO nation. Romania, like um, all the NATO nation, is facing similar challenges, plus the fact that being on the eastern border of, of Europe, it has a very strong uh, role into this defense, uh, collaborating with uh, all the allies uh, in uh, Romania itself, So there is, I think, a very uh, uh, impressive effort to modernize uh, the um, defense capability that Romania has. Let's explain to our viewers uh, what your group is doing, RTX, and then uh, the companies, Collins Aerospace or Raytheon, and why are you here today? What are you uh, offering? Yeah. Well, first of all, RTX is uh, probably the biggest defense group uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, it's divided in three main components. Raytheon, that is well known uh, by, by many uh, people because it is providing a lot of weapon system, like uh, the Patriot you mentioned. Uh, it's also uh, involved in the HIMARS that is uh, over the news every day. Uh, Pratt and Whitney is also well known because they do provide engines for many aircraft, uh, uh, civilian or military aircraft. And Collins uh, is a little bit less known. Uh, Collins Aerospace are very much involved also in the civilian world because we are one of the biggest provider of avionics for uh, civil aircraft, for instance. Uh, we work with both uh, Airbus and, and Boeing, plus also the other manufacturers around the world. And uh, there is also a big defense part, which is bigger and bigger, actually, uh, where we do provide uh, all the, I would say, C4 ISR capability, because whenever you want to build an efficient uh, defense system, you need weapons, you need sensors, but you need to connect all that together in order to extract the information from the sensor and deliver this information to, uh, to the, the people that are taking the decision, the commanders. And uh, so these people uh, can take the decision of using uh, different weapons to address the various threats that has been identified by many of the sensors. So this is the general idea of building a kind of connected battle space where 
you need to make sure that all the information which are collected somewhere will be delivered to the person, to the unit that needs this information. Uh, today, on top of it, uh, we have more and more sensors that are generating more and more data. So you need also to sort out all this information very much using artificial intelligence, for instance, in order to sort out and identify what are the information that are important in order to present to the commander an already uh, analyzed picture of a situation so decision could be taken much faster. So this is very much the business of Collins Aerospace to create this connected battle space to provide uh, 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 communication equipment, first of all, because at the heart of all this, you have radios, for instance. So uh, many of our radios are being deployed in Romania on the airborne platforms. Now, uh, the objective is to also uh, equip uh, the army with a much uh, more efficient uh, ground network to be able to communicate these uh, different uh, information that are being collected around the battlefield. Uh, you know also uh, that NATO is promoting uh, to the, the, for the NATO nations to move, uh, to, move to what we call multi-domain uh, operation. Uh, rather than having very stovepipe, uh, army, air force, uh, navy, space, cyber, uh, plus, in a coalition, all these in different nations, the idea is how can we work together, making the best use of whatever is available uh, across all the service, across all the armies, across all the nation. So this is a great challenge. Uh, NATO wants to move to multi-domain by 2030, which is tomorrow. And for that, we need to make a lot of efforts to upgrade all the communication equipment to upgrade the networks because uh, traditionally military tend to segregate information in different networks and tomorrow we want to be able to join all this network to have a, a data-centric architecture in order to have all the information that could be processed first of all by artificial intelligence to make sense out of all this data and then by the commander to be presented a, a, a combined operational picture that is integrating everything uh, that they need to know to take the faster decision. So this is very much the kind of thing we are working on. We do have a new generation of radio equipment. Uh, uh, for instance, on the ground, we have a PRC-162 radio that is uh, carrying some of the latest waveforms. It is the way uh, the radio communicates, uh, that is much more powerful than what uh, we used to have maybe five or 10 years ago. It is able to communicate much more information uh, to longer range, to much more uh, platforms, equipment, and so on. Can, can, can your solo solutions be used uh, to upgrade uh, F-16, by example? Because as you know, we bought some F-16, but they are second-hand. So can we upgrade their systems? Yes, uh, we are already uh, involved in some of the upgrades, uh, particularly of the first, batches, first batch of uh, the Portuguese F-16. Uh, we, are, we are putting some uh, uh, radio and data link uh, on those uh, aircraft, for instance, uh, which are for both line of sight, but also SATCOM, connection. We, we are already doing that. Uh, so yes, we can upgrade. We can upgrade aircraft. We can also upgrade vehicles because nowadays uh, when it comes to a radio uh, that used to be in the past one channel radio doing either voice or data, now in one radio you have the two channels that can do uh, voice and data at the same time. So you can save a lot of space, you can remove a number of antennas, uh, you can uh, really optimize, uh, uh, because all this space is relatively constrained, whether it's an, in an aircraft 
or whether it's a, in, a, in a vehicles, you need to optimize the space to have more capability in a, in, in, in a smaller space. Uh, so that's the type of thing, yes, we can be involved. You spoke about your partnership with ERE Brasov. This is a this is a very old institution in Romania. It's uh, founded in 1925, I think. Uh, they will uh, uh, there will be a centenary next year. And uh, as you know, the Romanian are very proud people, and we have some uh, some people uh, famous in the aviation history, yes. like Henri Quanda, who mm -hmm. lives uh, lived in France, in France and, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and also Aurel Vlaicu and. Uh, what do you think about the future of the Romanian avionics industry? As you say, the, the, the Romanian uh, industry has a long tradition uh, in the aerospace industry. So uh, I have worked uh, with the, the people of IR Brashov, huh, and they are very competent, very knowledgeable people. Uh, and, and therefore, it's very easy uh, to, uh, to, to find solutions together and uh, they are capable of integrating our equipment uh, on their own into, for instance, the Puma helicopters. Uh, they have been installing many of our radios on the Puma helicopters, and they, they, they know very well how to do that. So they, they are very knowledgeable uh, with a long experience, so very, uh, uh, very good engineers capable of uh, understanding and uh, very quickly the latest uh, technologies. Do you think we can expand this industry, this defense industry in Romania? Definitely, and, and, and uh, it is necessary to expand it in order to address, uh, as I mentioned, the new challenges, uh, and uh, in order also to get locally all the necessary uh, support uh, for uh, the evolution of the system. You know, as I mentioned, uh, with this permanent race to be more effective to, to integrate more technology. The system that we are uh, delivering now are not systems that will stay for 20 years without any modification. More and more, because they are most of them now software based, they will require permanent updates uh, in order to improve their capability all the time. So it means that you need people locally, software people in particular, to be able to continuously uh, upgrade uh, the capability and adjust the capability of a system that they have procured uh, in, in uh, a few years ago, for instance. So that's a, this kind of spiral development is now becoming uh, the norms for most of the defense system. Last fall, I spoke with uh, General Bridlov, the former uh, commander of the of the NATO forces, and uh, he said to me that the Ukraine's war changed a couple of things in terms of how the war is uh, waging these days. It's different. I mean, nobody expected so many drones to be used in uh, so many operations and so on. And my question is, do you think the defense industry change its focus after this war in terms of uh, what solutions are you providing and uh, what uh, innovations are you looking into? So do you think this war changed how the defense industry is viewing the, the, the future weapons and the future conflicts and the future combats? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I would say, first of all, um, it has uh, demonstrated uh, the necessity to adapt quickly. Uh, the Ukrainian has been extremely good at changing their own procedures, their own ways of uh, uh, sharing information between themselves, uh, I would say out of the box. They, they didn't follow necessarily strictly their original doctrine, then they were able to adapt uh, the doctrine. This is all about transformation. It's the idea that, yeah, maybe technology can bring you something, but if you don't change also your way of doing things, uh, it will be only a limited improvement. So you need to, technology can help you uh, also uh, do things differently. And that, I believe, is one of the strongest lessons learned from uh, what's going on in Ukraine at a very impressive pace. After that, you were mentioning the heavy use of, of drones. This is something that was expected because we see drones are more and more important. 
What has been uh, quite impressive is that using relatively cheap, mostly civilian technology has already delivered uh, quite interesting effects. Uh, so that's also a, a lesson for us in the defense industry to try because the volume, it's a quantity is important. It's not, you may have the best system in the world technically. If you have two or three, it might not be enough because in front of maybe not so good system, but where, where you have thousands of them, you may be in trouble. So there is a, a necessity to have uh, not only technology and quality, but you need also the quantity. And that's also one of the lessons uh, learned a lot from, uh, from what's going on uh, in Ukraine. So uh, technology we manage. We have been developing technology. This is our core, core business and we continue doing it. But now we need also to make sure that we are able to provide quantities. And, and, and in the, the drone industry, yeah, maybe uh, cheaper, smaller drones, but in large numbers. So that's probably one of the, of the things. Let's tell our viewers that your group is exposing today here like uh, three products. Uh, one of them is uh, Sidewinder. This is an old rocket from the 90s. But also you have a rocket, the Amram, which is new and can be... I think uh, I read somewhere that uh, the helmet that the pilot is uh, wearing can look at one uh, one point and uh, the rocket is launching, right? Is, is this right? This, this, this sounds like science fiction for no, our I, viewers. I, I, am, I am not the, uh, the expert on, on yeah. the missiles, but I mean, yeah, this type of thing exists. Huh? You, you, you know, uh, we are doing, for instance, uh, the helmet of the pilot of the F-35. So everything is integrated in the helmet. You know, a helmet for F-35 costs quite a lot of money and it's specific to the pilot. So each pilot, they have uh, 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 the helmet designed for themselves. And they are able to do this type of thing. First of all, to have a see-through across all directions. So they can see through the aircraft to see what's behind, what's uh, below and so on. And, and, and uh, being able to target with your eyes is something yeah, that is, has been possible for a while, yes. Okay, my, my, my final question for you is... Uh, uh, as you know, is a saying, uh, old saying, that uh, if you want peace, you have to prepare for war. Nobody yeah. wants war. We want peace. I mean, Romanians, French nationals and everyone, Ukrainians also. Uh, but uh, you have to, to have a strong army to be prepared for uh, what is the worst. And my question is because every innovation has a dark side. The artificial intelligence, there are, you know, conversation now about what are the risks of that? And my question is if you see from your experience that some military innovation can, uh, can be, uh, you know, transformed to a peaceful purpose. Do you think that in the future that some innovation from the military field will be, will be used in the, in the peaceful yeah, manner? Yeah, yeah. This has been existing for, for a long time. Actually, in the past, uh, the military were a little bit at the head of the technology development, and many of the military uh, technology was then uh, moved to the civilian world for, for all sorts of purposes. Nowadays, we see it going both directions. There are lots of civilian technologies that are now moving to the military because they can improve. So it goes both ways. So this is why we are also investing a lot of money on what we call this dual-use technology. This is very important because uh, in the civilian uh, world, there is a, the pace is, is traditionally faster uh, than it is in the military. And as I mentioned, we need to progress faster and faster. So we need to uh, get this fast turnaround of technology development and implementation that is coming from the civilian world to be able to do the same thing on the military side. So, yes, they are. Uh, you mentioned about uh, AI, typically. Uh, AI, we see it now every day uh, in our, uh, almost in our life. Uh, uh, and, and it's been used also in the military world more and more. And we are using some of the technology that has been originally developed for the civilian, being used to, as I mentioned, 
to sort out information when you have loads of information uh, in which you know there are uh, potential threats, potential targets. So artificial intelligence is helping to make a priority out of this data in order to identify the right one faster than if you had to rely only on human operator. Now, of course, and especially the NATO countries, they, have, they are also considering ethics. Uh, there are plenty of things that uh, you don't want to do because of ethics, uh, because AI is able to recognize people, to recognize a number of things, but you don't want to have a weapon that will, uh, that will uh, trigger uh, its uh, effect without having uh, a man in the loop validating what AI has identified. So this is some of the limitation that we are putting on the technology, but we have also to be careful because maybe not all the nations will have this level of ethics. So we have to balance uh, in order to know uh, in terms of autonomous uh, systems, uh, how far we are ready to go uh, because there are some ethical uh, aspect of it uh, behind. All this autonomy kind of system that we are currently developing will have also a use uh, for the uh, civilian world because we will see more and more of these autonomous cars, of these autonomous airplanes. Uh, this is also uh, a dual-use kind of technology uh, where we can apply uh, what we are developing on the civilian in the military and in the military on the civilian side. Mr. Fontanier, thank you for your time. Thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you again in Romania. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, looking forward. Thanks.